Good morning and welcome to Global Health Cast, brought to you by Global Health Press. In this podcast series, once a week, we bring to you news and views about vaccines and vaccination. I am Joe Schmidt, and with me, as always, from Switzerland is Dr. Melvin Senecas. Good afternoon, Melvin. Good afternoon, Professor Schmidt, and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to people who are watching us today. The topics of today will be blood biomarkers predicted cognition six and 12 months post COVID. WHO reports three more MERS coronavirus cases. And meningococcal B vaccine is associated with reduced gonorrhea incidence. We have a, a one slide on avian flu in Spain. There is an outbreak among poultry workers. And finally, I will continue with my vaccination and pregnancy series. Today it is COVID-19. But let's start again, as always, with Melvin and a COVID topic. Yes. So this one um, has really been uh, getting the attention of many researchers globally because it basically talks about two distinct blood biomarker profiles that seem to predict cognitive deficits six and 12 months after COVID um, infection. And this is a prospective UK uh, study, study in the UK, and it shows that both of these biomarkers, these profiles, um, they are featured in coagulation. And this was reported by authors in Nature Medicine. Um, basically around uh, 2000 patients hospitalized for COVID during the first wave of the pandemic, they, their blood, um, blood samples were taken and they, their blood profiles were, profiles were reviewed. And basically they showed that uh, there was a high level of fibrinogen correlated with both objective and subjective cogn cognitive deficits. And the second profile was linked to an elevated D-dimer relative to the C-reactive protein or the CRP with um, subjective cognitive deficits and occupational impact, which was partly mediated by fatigue and shortness of breath. And I think the finding is important because it gives us a clue about one mechanism that might cause post-COVID cognitive deficits. So there may be several causes or several factors, but there is a link between the clotting system and long COVID. Th that's the message I take from this. Is that right? Yes, correct, Professor. That's one of the possible mechanisms, yeah. Very good. Very interesting. So stay tuned on that one. I think that will be with us. And actually, I have one more topic later on. Now, Melvin, you also report a case or about an outbreak of MERS coronavirus. Yes. So um, MERS or the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome is a viral respiratory infection caused by the MERS coronavirus. So it's a, basically a family member of the coronavirus family, right? Since the first report of MERS coronavirus in, the, in Saudi Arabia in 2012, Human infections have been reported from 27 countries now, um, and approximately 36% of patients with MERS have died, though this may be an overestimate of the true mortality as mild cases of mers cov may be missed by the existing surveillance system, and uh, the case fatality ratio is calculated based only on laboratory confirmed cases. And this is just to remind us that other than SARS-CoV-2, there are other coronaviruses out there, um, excluding even the milder ones that, um, that spread during the winter season. Um, there is this MERS coronavirus that is basically related to exposure to, to camels. Very good. So there may be additional coronaviruses in animals. And once they jump to humans, then if, if they can infect humans, there may be a high more there will be a high mortality a high case fatality rate whereas those that easily spread from human to human probably are less uh, fatal that would be one of my takes from that story is that correct that's right that's right okay interesting and ksa is kingdom of saudi arabia i would assume yes. right kingdom of saudi okay. arabia yes yeah yeah. So they, 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 I guess the virus is circling, they're circulating there among animals. So that, that is the interesting point, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Very good. And you also have something on meningococcal B on gonorrhea. Look, the meningococcal B is uh, Neisseria, right? And there is Neisseria meningitis with the 12 or 15 zero groups, and there is Neisseria gonorrhea. And Neisseria gonorrhea causes gonorrhea, and now this meningococcal B vaccine cross-protects. So yes. what is the story here? So this study was actually prompted by a 27 report, so before COVID. Um, this was reported by researchers from New Zealand um, showing that the um, meningococcal group B vaccine appeared to reduce gonorrhea incidence. Um, in this current study that I'm presenting here is basically a study conducted at two universities in Oregon in the United States. It suggested that meningococcal group B vaccine may offer protection against gonorrhea infection, um, and this was reported in JAMA Network Open. In the study, researchers within the Oregon Public Health Division looked at gonorrhea incidents among more than 30,000 students at the University of Oregon and at the Oregon State University who received one or more doses of the vaccine following uh, a Group B meningococcal outbreak on two campuses in 2015 and 2016. And basically, they show that um, th this meningococcal Group B vaccine could actually offer protection against gonorrhea infection. Is that true for both products that are out there? There is this four component uh, vaccine with uh, OMV and there is the uh, meningococcal B FHBP vaccine. Are they both included in this study or is this only applicable to one of the two products? So this is actually looking at the OMV based MBV. So the story is uh, the OMV um, would or has been shown to prevent uh, cross uh, to prevent uh, gonorrhea to some degree, and uh, there is cross protection. That, that's then the message here. Yep, but but maybe we can also say that probably if the other vaccine is included in some study, maybe it will show the same thing. You know? Yeah. Very good. Uh, uh, thank you very much for this one. And I have a short story that is also on long COVID. And there is a great study out there from Nature Medicine. It's really worth looking at. It is looking at post-acute COVID syndrome. And it looks at um, the development of this over time and how it's going down. And what they have here, what you see here is different outcomes in the grayish uh, boxes here. And uh, this is neurologic uh, symptoms, cardiovascular symptoms, mental health, coagulation, pulmonary, kidney, fatigue, gastrointestinal, muscular, and diabetes. And if you see that here over time from left to right, all the incidences go down, all the risk goes down, right? So all the, the bars go lower. And here on the left side, you see more uh, more easily, uh, I apologize, I couldn't make the slide any clearer. Um, the violet bars are non-hospitalized COVID patients and the green bars are hospitalized patients. And what you see here, the hospitalized patients, those with more de severe disease, have a higher risk uh, and uh, duration of uh, uh, post-COVID syndrome. And you can see, but for all groups, this goes down after uh, goes down with time. This is from 90 to 720 days. This is a very big study with very many patients, and uh, um, this is really worth reading. The reference is down here. So, if you're interested in that topic, again, COVID um, severity is linked to development of long COVID. Basically, that's one of the messages. And more severe COVID is linked to longer persistence of more severe symptoms. That would be a summary. Any questions or any any uh, additions from your side? Well, I think, Professor, this has been um, hypothesized already even before we knew much about long COVID, right? Um, researchers have been saying that potentially those people who had longer um, infection or severe cases, their chances of still having symptoms right after infection would be expected to be more than those who had mild COVID. And I think we're seeing it in all these different studies. Yeah. 
Very good. Now I have one other outbreak. Um, uh, um, MERS was covered by Melvin, and this is a report on highly pathogenic avian influenza, H5N1 outbreak in Spain. And uh, I guess the, the story here, this was among poultry workers in a single farm. And um, I guess the story is, again, uh, the avian flu is with us. And uh, what we are worried about is that it may spread to humans at some point, and that initially, at least, it may cause high fatality rates. So stay tuned on that one. We keep an eye on these outbreaks, and we'll uh, tell you about it once we have additional information on other outbreaks in the future. Melvin, you are an influenza specialist. What are your thoughts here? So just uh, a week ago, Professor, China also reported that um, uh, a, a young child died of H9 uh, influenza in, in one of the provinces. And that is the fourth case this year. Um, all of them are actually either very young or very um, uh, older generation or a very young uh, child. And I think it, um, again, relates to uh, the immune system, right? Um, because these are either um, really the older individuals who are exposed to, the, uh, to birds or very young kids who, for some reason, because their parents or grandparents work in the poultry, you know, poultry yeah. industry. Yeah, so close contact is needed, high exposure, intensive exposure. That is one prerequisite. And then uh, the status of the immune system may be relevant as well. Yeah. Finally, I have uh, a continuation of our vaccination in pregnancy uh, story. And this time uh, it is about COVID-19. Now, uh, first, what you want to know is, is there a burden of disease in pregnant women? Why vaccinate during pregnancy? And if you look here, outcome pregnant versus non-pregnant women, you see here hospitalization rate is higher, intensive care unit admission is 10 times higher, uh, invasive mechanical ventilation is much higher, and uh, death may be insignificantly reduced, but this just shows that there is a very uh, high risk for pregnant women to, um, yeah, when it comes to COVID infection. Now, uh, another study here uh, looks at outcomes, and it, it, that shows the data for pre-Delta, Delta, and Omicron. And again, you see that uh, there is a higher risk, uh, even in this study uh, with the Delta um, uh, variant. Here, you see a higher risk for uh, maternal death uh, in this study. In the end, the next question is you have, so there is a high burden of disease that is even higher in the than in the general population. And the second, what you want to know is, is the vaccine working? And this is now a published study from, um, uh, from Israel, from the Mayo Clinic, and again from Israel. And what you see here is uh, there is uh, adjusted hazard ratio of 0.22, which is a reduction. And here you see Mayo Clinic health system analysis. And again here, you see a benefit. And finally, there is this Israeli observational cohort study, which is a, I guess, quite large study. And here, um, vaccine efficacy is 97 to 89%. So uh, this is really, um, really uh, very interesting um, uh, and a positive finding uh, to vaccinate women during pregnancy. So now we have the burden of disease, which is higher in pregnant women. We have the efficacy of the vaccine or the effectiveness in this case. And finally, one, we want to know, uh, is there any safety concern? And that you see here uh, from different studies summarized in this one slide, there is no concern regarding spontaneous abortion, hypertension, emergency cesarean delivery, stillbirth actually one study showed a reduction of stillbirths in vaccinated women, low APGA score, no, uh, uh, no connection, preterm birth in one study, even a reduction, small for gestational age, low birth weight, and intensive care unit admission in one study, even a reduction with a vaccination. And I guess one can summarize this in this slide that I showed you for pertussis and influenza as well. 
The burden of disease due to COVID in pregnant women is high. Vaccine efficacy and effectiveness have been documented and the safety profile is acceptable. There is no safety concern and probably even a benefit uh, for the various outcomes. Melvin, uh, any questions, concerns, comments on COVID-19 vaccination in pregnant women? Not specifically for COVID vaccine, Professor, but I think in general, um, when you talk to someone who's either pregnant or planning to be pregnant, the question is always really safety, right? Will the vaccine harm uh, the baby or will it uh, increase chances of miscarriage and all these things? And I think the, the, the wealth of data at the moment that we have with COVID and with flu and with the other vaccines being used in pregnancy is really showing that um, these vaccines are um, well tolerated in pregnant women. Yeah. Again, uh, follow your local guidance and recommendations before you administer the vaccine or any vaccine during pregnancy. There are some vaccines that are specifically recommended. Uh, with RSV, there is now one vaccine that is even licensed for um, vaccination in pregnancy, but some vaccines should not be given during pregnancy and life vaccines must not be given during pregnancy. And more of that we will cover next week. With that, we can close our meeting for today. We spoke about blood biomarkers predicted cognition six and 12 months post COVID and Melvin showed you this has to do with the clotting system. He reported on three more MERS cases from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. He showed you that one meningococcal B vaccine is associated with reduced gonorrhea incidence among students. We spoke about avian flu outbreak in poultry workers in Spain. And finally, I hope I convinced you that it makes sense to get COVID-19 vaccine to pregnant women. Thank you very much for listening to us today. I am Joe Schmidt, and I say goodbye now. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe.